Okay, so I think we can start. Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm very glad to have you here to this uh, uh, angel um, webinar. This today is devoted to the topic of new opportunities for action with the revised UNESCO recommendation. This is the fourth uh, angel webinar um, uh, this year. And this, this event in particular is uh, co-organized by ANGEL and UNESCO because we wanted to, 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 to discuss with them the, the process of this very long process uh, of, uh, of the adoption, a revision of the UNESCO recommendation, which has recently uh, adopted in, uh, in this uh, last November. Uh, ANGEL has a very strong and meaningful relationship with UNESCO, uh, especially starting from this uh, last... Uh, uh, international conference, uh, uh, which we co-organized in uh, Paris at the UNESCO headquarters uh, this last uh, this last June. The idea of this uh, uh, webinar is to provide angel members and angel friends, uh, so, so all people interested in the topic of global education and learning and global citizenship um, education, the opportunity for uh, exchanging idea uh, and then to, to discuss a little bit, starting from some inputs from some very important experts uh, on the topic. And the goal of this webinar is to support somehow the implementation of, uh, of this uh, uh, recommendation, especially for this to the topic related to global education and learning. As we, as we will see in this last edition, at least that revision, the text, the very last text of the, of the um, of their recommendation, global education and learning and related issues uh, are playing a major role in this, in this topic. That's why it's important that we just start discussing uh, this issue, which are very relevant uh, for the even for the research for the research the research community as you as you probably know a recommendation uh, the unesco recommendation is probably the most powerful instrument that supranational organization and especially unesco has have to engage nations and national states about peace about human rights about sustainability but also to about global education uh, the educational learning that's why we do believe that uh, this recommendation is a key document, not only for policymakers and practitioners, but also for the research community. The format about this uh, this event uh, is uh, is simple. We start with with a short presentation uh, from uh, Lydia Ruprecht, uh, who is a spe program specialist for the the section of Global Citizenship and Edupa Peace Education at UNESCO. One uh, of the of the key uh, figure in the whole process of the revision. Uh, after uh, this in initial introduction, Professor Katerina Popovic, who is the Secretary General of International Council of Ad Adult Education, a major um, expert in adult education, uh, another key point for this, uh, for this uh, uh, new uh, revi revised recommendation. Uh, therefore, Carla, Professor Carla Sabatini, uh, she's UNESCO Chair of edu on Education for Sustainable Development and Global Citizenship Education at the uh, Universidad de San Andrés in Argentina. And finally, this initial session, Professor Karen Pashpi, Professor of Global Citizenship Education at the Manchester University, another important um, expert in the, in the topic of global citizenship uh, uh, education and related issues. Let's start, uh, uh, we don't, I don't want to waste uh, more time. So Lydia, thank you for being here. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Massimiliano, uh, for that in warm introduction. Yes, yeah, so um, uh, I just want to add from a UNESCO perspective, echo everything Massimiliano said and extend a very warm uh, uh, word of thanks to the whole ANGEL team, to yourself, Massimiliano, to Kester, to Doug, um, and everyone else uh, who's a member of the group um, for, for giving us this opportunity. This is actually our first moment uh, to go live uh, presenting an adopted text. So it's a, it's a little bit of emotion, and I am delighted that uh, the first <laughs> is with ANGEL. And uh, 
And then um, also a word of thanks to all those who are here and who are who will be or will be watching this video later on. A word of thanks to this vast and vibrant network of, of academics and research and practitioners involved in the field, the broad field of global learning, global citizenship education, that have been inspiring me personally, inspiring UNESCO and to to do more and better. Um, uh, and that we've been listening to for the past 10 years, because though the recommendation was revised uh, and the work took was took place over two years. It's been actually been a 10-year process of gestation, if you could say, um, where the, the ideas exchange have, have made their way into the document. Uh, and I hope that, um, as you will see, that a lot of what is there is a reflection of the thinking going on in this space of discussion, but also in others. But but really, this group has, has been, uh, this, this field has been a large source of inspiration. Having said that, uh, straight to the to to the uh, the presentation, I will maybe um, yes say a few words now about about the recommendation for those who haven't been involved in the revision who are less familiar with all these UN instruments and uh, and documents. Um, the recommendation is one of nine uh, UNESCO um, uh, non-binding uh, legal instruments uh, pertaining to education in the hierarchy of norms. It's just under convention. Um, uh, which we all tend to be more familiar with. This document so was adopted by consensus, and I insist on by consensus, um, because it means it did not go to vote, which means that 194 member states within the organization felt happy, comfortable, and agreed with the text, which makes it a very powerful, maybe the most powerful uh, legal instrument, point of departure, uh, uniting member states on, uh, on, on the topic. Um, as a legal instrument and a recommendation, uh, it spells out how education plays a role or should play as a, as a standard, play a role in building lasting peace. So it sets a horizon, it's an aspiration that all member states agreed to be working working towards. Uh, it's important to know that this recommendation, as Massimilio mentioned, it didn't come out from nowhere. nowhere. It's actually the revision of an instrument that was adopted in the 70s in the midst of the Cold War. So the spirit of that, that in the original instrument, which is is actually remarkable, uh, is still present in the document today, uh, sig though significantly um, updated. What is the the aim of this document? So the, the aim uh, is, is is in essence to help ensure that education systems in the broadest sense are fit for purpose uh, in the 21st century in the sense that it's aligned with the 2030 agenda, the, the whole SDG declaration and framework, uh, but also the outcomes of UNESCO's Future of Education report that I'm assuming you're, many of you are familiar with, which is, is a really uh, uh, a, a broad and, and deep reflection on where education should be uh, moving towards uh, given our contemporary world and its challenges. Um, and also inspired by the outcomes of the Transforming Education Summit, which was the big UN gathering in 2022, uh, also stating that uh, if education, if we wanted to have a chance to survive and build a, future, uh, a sustainable and peaceful future, we needed to transform education systems. So inspired by that, the instrument really now takes a, a step further and is a roadmap, provides a roadmap to ensure that educations are fit for those purposes in the 21st century. At a, at, a, at a little more mezzo micro scale, the purpose is to help basically ensure that people at all ages throughout life um, are empowered with the knowledge and skills and values and behaviors, social and emotional skills notably as well, um, to effectively participate and contribute to building for peace. So, and in, so in short, in the UN and of world, it means infusing basically the, the values and principles of the Charter of the United Nations, UNESCO's constitution, international human rights into education, um, more simply said. Now, um, um, the, the document has many highlights and, and uh, for, for this audience in particular, I would like to highlight on, on the, 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 the most significant features in the vision uh, and in the in the aspiration, but also uh, in the technical uh, and the technical guidance. Um, in terms of the vision, what is what is so uh, innovative? Um, first of all, it's grounded in a contemporary understanding of peace, meaning that peace is not just obviously the end the end of violence, the end of war, or direct forms of violence. It is it is the SDG framework, meaning it's about ensuring dignity, rights, ending poverty, um, and seeing peace as a continuum between interpersonal peace, some would even say inner peace, and interstate peace. We cannot have lasting peace if uh, if there is such an equality and violence. 
um, and suffering at a national level. So that that is the overall vision. Uh, it is also grounded in human rights, so human rights based, restating the the foundation of human rights um, uh, as as aspired in the Futures of Education report. It has a lifelong, life-wide perspective. Understanding education is not just about formal education. It takes place in our homes and the workplace and our lives and throughout uh, different stages. Katarina will say more. It's a society-wide, therefore, also. It means that uh, there are different actors playing an educational role. And, and now that you know, we, we know also, we understand much better and notably within UNESCO, what culture means and what is the what how cultural transmission takes place. We see cultural bearers as key um, educators as well, civil society at large. So it, ha it gives an empowering role to all the different actors involved in the learning process. Um, we believe that it has transformation in the DNA of the instrument. So it's a really transformative tool or first tool, but also it, it envisions education as something that is not just about acquiring knowledge, but it transforms oneself. And in that process is a, a basis for transforming society, which is why the argument that it is helping to build sustainable futures, the, uh, what UNESCO really insistence, insists on. The other envision, which is more innovative, we talk less about, it, but it's, it gives a prominent place to culture and a, our nuanced understanding of culture. Um, seeing culture um, as the context, but also seeing education as a cultural right. Uh, and so therefore, education has to be meaningful. It creates sense or sense making, uh, and it is a, a resonates in a cultural context, but it also celebrates cultural diversity and gives the tools for individuals to participate uh, in a society that is culturally diverse and to, um, uh, to uh, thrive in their cultural identity. And that is how learning probably works best, uh, and which is why it also has that participatory uh, perspective. Uh, incur the recommendation encourages participation and learning through experience and participation. So that is uh, some key elements. More could be said, but it's it gives this idea that it's an aspirational document uh, that tries to be really forward-looking beyond the next two years, looking far down the road beyond 2030, where we we would like to see education um, by uh, 2050 or sooner. <laughs> uh, the technical guidance. Uh, it is. After all, a roadmap. So it's very practical, very technical, very, very concrete. Um, it covers, um, it gives uh, guidance on uh, all levels of education from early childhood care to uh, higher ed education and even research institutions, all forms, non formal and formal, um, and types, adult learning and, uh, and TVET. Um, Etc. It's uh, it covers the rec the technical guidance covers um, every aspect of the education system, so all the policy areas, curriculum, uh, pedagogy, teacher development laws, policies, uh, learning materials, learning environments, etc. Um, it is also, uh, and I'd like to insist on this because of who I'm speaking to, that the, the document also uh, constitutes a common ground that links together different educational approaches, like global citizenship education, global learning, human rights education and training, education for sustainable development, or intercultural education. We've tried to really see in this document what brings these approaches together um, and articulating that. So we have a, a holistic view of how these different transformative approaches that to education are working towards similar goals because it can be confusing for many countries or people, how do these areas connect? Um, the guidance also reflects, integrates contemporary issues that we know are challenges to peace, like uh, hate speech, violent extremism, uh, um, promoting health and well-being, mental health, gender equality, digital citizenship, media information literacy, et cetera, all these contemporary issues uh, that we know that our teachers are struggling with and learners as well. And then importantly, it has a strong focus on monitoring policy learning, which did not exist in the original document and is now seen as the key condition for making this instrument applicable, usable. It's not just a pretty text. It needs to be monitored, used uh, to improve what we do uh, and to design the future programs. For GCD, uh, more specifically, I was asked to focus on this. So how does it relate to our fields of interest here. Well, first of all, global citizenship education is um, is in the title. It's, it's, it's no minor feat. The official title is long-winded. It's a recommendation on education for peace, uh, and human rights, international understanding, cooperation, fundamental freedoms, global citizenship, sustainable development. 
As you can see, you can tell that it was actually a politically negotiated title by lots of member states, but thankfully they, they accepted uh, to have it referred to commonly as the Recommendation on Education for Peace, Human Rights and Sustainable Development. But GCD or Global Syndrome is there and it's prominently stated uh, insofar as there is now an officially internationally agreed definition of GCD, which has always been a struggle for those doing policy work, advocacy, or having um, the field recognize it as being relevant. So it defines GCD in refer reference to the Education 2030 framework um, and, 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 and the way it's broken down to in, in the learning objectives. It is recognized uh, as a guiding principle that what makes good quality education to build peace is that it should promote, education should promote the values and principles and of global citizenship education. Um, so global citizenship is recognized as a valued area of study across, across curricular, not necessarily standalone subject, but something that in a field of of work and of research. Um, it's also acknowledged as relevant as early as early childhood care and education and up to adult learning, which had never been actually formally stated before. Um, and I think what's important to underline is that um, the, the whole section on higher education institutions research uh, is uh, quite, oh, is, is is also uh, present and, and they're therefore giving a space for those working on GCD and research uh, to do more. Uh, in that field. We'll talk about that later, I think. So what does the document look like? In essence, it has a preamble, um, like any convention, stating the principles and a series of what we call operative paragraphs, uh, as well as an appendix. Um, now, the appendix is a list of key normative documents that member states consider as relevant materials to understand uh, this instrument, So these, which gives I guess you would say uh, um, uh, some context to the text. The uh, operative paradigm, paragraphs contain, as I mentioned, definitions. So we now have these internationally agreed definitions, the consensus views. There are guiding principles, uh, 14 guiding principles in particular, that um, are, are considered to be as uh, fundamental to ensure uh, that education systems uh, are actually uh, supporting the goals of peace, human rights, global citizenship. And these principles should be embedded in all aspects of education systems to ensure that, that they're really transformative. So in a sense, it's it's, it's sort of a, a, defin, uh, a definition of what is transformative. It's education that supports the, uh, and then integrates these guiding principles. Um, so the document also includes learning objectives. It's not exhaustive. Uh, we understand that, but it's a, a common ground that uh, says that these, uh, you know, if educations can support these objectives, we're on the way to provide people with the type of skills uh, that are needed to thrive in our world. And of course, there are uh, a, a lot of action areas covering the different aspects that I mentioned, every level of education, every system, aspect of the education system. So with, with such a rich tool, it can be used in many different ways. It's a, it's a call to action to member states, so it's very much used in the, in the state apparatus and, and, and the global monitoring mechanisms uh, and at every level of national government. Uh, but it's also an advocacy tool for those working out of, uh, out of uh, government institutions because it was adopted by consensus and there's going to be mechanisms in place uh, to hold countries accountable or to monitor, help encourage them to implement. Um, so um, it's, an, uh, it's a, a tool for advocacy and it's a benchmarking marking tool because we know it's an aspiration. I think none or very few countries can claim that they've impl they've implemented it really fully to every every detail. And in that sense it can tell help us design to see how far and how well we are progressing with in the view of, of achieving this goal. And so therefore it can be used by many different um categories of actors. And here we've, we've sort of given an example of how it can be used by teachers, school leaders, policymakers, learners, parents, civil society. And I would like to say that there's a missing a block here is researchers and those in academia. And so I hope that the conversation that we will have will help us add a block, add a, a pictogram to this, this where we would say, how could you use by researchers? Uh, and then a few little bullet points and also, of course, more than the bullet points, things that you could do. But to give you an example, we, you know, talking about how could you use by teachers, you would say, what does why would a teacher be interested in this instrument? Uh, well, a teacher could be using it as as an as a subject of study. What is global citizenship? How does one regulate at a global level uh, education? And should we? Be? So it's actually a subject of study, uh, but also it could be used to advocate for greater and better teacher development opportunities because it does commit member states to doing more teacher training and development. It can also help teachers self-assess with their own teaching. There are interesting things there to measure, you know, how they're performing and doing if they could change practices. Uh, some examples of how the tool could be used by teachers and 
other categories of actors. A word about the before concluding and a word about uh, the follow-up because now that it was adopted, there's the work begins <laughs> in a way. Um, and we, we are putting together a follow-up strategy. So this conversation will also help us fine tune our strategy at UNESCO. And we'd love to hear your thoughts. Uh, but it's uh, for us, obviously, an advocacy, advocacy tool from member states towards governments to, to encourage them to implement. So we'll be, we'll be developing communication packages and we hope you'll be using them. We'll be developing an implementation guide and definitely calling on you uh, to help uh, to unpack this recommendation so it becomes a working tool for governments. Um, and also we're planning of uh, creating international learning community of practice and asking member states to actually designate an institution that will be the national focal point uh, for, for promoting global, uh, for promoting, sorry, the recommendation uh, to ensure, sustain, ensure sustainability. Learning from the past where tend the recommendation was forgotten for a couple of decades, um, and we, we don't want this to happen again. Uh, so how we can build it into uh, accountabilities uh, at the national level. And then, uh, of course, the usual uh, monitoring at national and global levels uh, on target 4.7. So, so these are some of the things we plan to do in the follow-up strategy. So all this can be found in a brochure that we're just putting last touches to. It's going to be released on the International Day of Education, uh, which, as you know, is on the 24th of January. I'm happy to inform you that we'll be, we'll be focusing on learning for lasting peace in honor of the adoption of the recommendation at UNESCO. And, uh, and you're invited to join uh, online events in New York. And a brochure explaining the recommendation will be released on this occasion to learn more. So that's it for me. Thanks. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Lydia. Very clear, very inspiring um, presentation, introduction of this uh, crucial, crucial document. Now we start the the, the discussion, starting from the three uh, presenters. Uh, the first of uh, whom is uh, Professor Katarina Popovic, and she will address the topic of leaving no one behind, looking beyond formal education. Katarina. Please. Thank you very much, Massimiliano, and thanks, Lydia, for this nice introduction. I was honored to be part of the group that work on this document, so I'm really glad that I can share a few thoughts with you today. And because of the limited time, I have decided to pick up three elements, so lifelong, life-wide, and life-deep, and that you will see why I have decided to go for these three aspects. So I will start by um, uh, something that Lydia said uh, the first set of recommendations was developed during the Cold War. And now the recent one, the one we are talking about, is in the middle of, how should we call it? Well, it's anything but the Cold War. But the world is really burning. And of course, I could mention uh, uh, Ukraine or, uh, you know, uh, Israel Gaza or, well, whatever. But these are go to... kind of new ones. But there were plenty of the conflicts even before that. So uh, it adds the sense of urgency that we usually relate to the sustainable development, environmental issues. You remember Secretary General of the United Nations, he said, we have just a few more years in terms of environment. Well, when it comes to peace, I think we don't have any time left. So what I want to say is we cannot wait only for schools and for formal education and for children to be taught on the issues of peace interculturalism, then to grow up and to take over the world and make it a better place. No, we have to act now and immediately. It means we need to start with adults. Adults are decision makers. Adults are those who shape policies, who shape also the education system. So it's urgent really to start also uh, or to do it parallel. Uh, uh, also including adult education. That's why this lifelong learning perspective is, I think, very, very much needed. And the urgency of the world we live in and the character of the conflicts are really, I think, uh, underlying that. So just looking what's going around is telling us, first, we need lifelong learning perspective. We cannot wait for the grown-up children. And secondly, we uh, definitely need also peace as a priority topic. To put it differently, What's going on in the world is not the consequence, I would say, uh, of the lack of uh, digital skills or the fact that we are still not using artificial intelligence enough or things like this. This is definitely the lack or the problem in the value system of misunderstanding, efforts on increasing peace and so on. 
And because of uh, the need to work with others, I would say lifelong learn learning perspective is more than, than urgent. Then the next one, life-wide perspective. I mentioned uh, policymakers. So this is one of the groups we need to work with. And that's difficult to get policymakers in the classroom and then to teach them about peace education. Or the other groups, the simple citizens, I mean, if we can call this a group, uh, we see the tendency to, um, uh, to get more into the trap of populism and populist rhetorics. Uh, uh, we see the increase of extreme violent uh, political programs and actions, increase of terrorism. So we need to work with adult people, with the citizens, in their living and working environment to make them resistant to this kind of harm, harmful, harmful things. And then, of course, teachers who have the difficult task, all the expectations are on them. So we need also to help them to improve their understanding of formal and non-formal, and then to broaden up the, uh, the activities. So if we have in mind these different groups, so being it like policymakers or education policymakers, politicians, citizens, and so on, it's very clear that we cannot rely on a formal education system. But non-formal and informal learning, treating being treated as a sectors where we need to increase the influence and the efforts on peace and, um, uh, and interculturalism and similar values. So it's uh, especially media and social media, it's not easy, but it does make it less important. These are the best educators today the most powerful, powerful educators. So these are the areas where we could go, have to go. Uh, working place, uh, families, uh, community level, these are the fields and these are the factors they shape, not only the knowledge and skills, but also the values of, of people, adult people, but also uh, all human beings. And that's why we need so much of this non-formal education and informal learning settings. That would be for the life wide. And now I come to life deep. And life deep has to do very much with trans more transformative learning, which is an important element of this document. And uh, why transformative learning? What does it have to do with life deep? And how do we include it in peace and intercultural education? Well, we know from the theory, and now I jump from my role of Secretary General of ICAI to my role of this researcher. It has to do with emotions and social emotional skills. They are highlighted in this document. And they are very much needed in the, in the, if you want to achieve transformative learning, learning process, and if you want it to be sustainable. That means teaching and preaching, addressing only cognitive level is by far not enough. So this is only the starting point, and we need to uh, apply the didactics and the methods or pedagogies that have to do with social emotional learning, with embodied learning, if we want really to touch people and if we want to trigger transformative processes. So the good old methods, not so good, but old methods of just teaching and going just to the giving information, giving knowledge is by far not enough. So skills, competencies, but also agency, increasing the agency of people and make them really being ready to move and to uh, to be engaged for what they believe in or for the new the value system that will be working for the humankind, for peace, interculturalism, solidarity, and so on. So these are my three points. I hope I'm still uh, within the given time. Thank you. Thank you, Katarina. Thank you very much. Very important uh, um, discussion on uh, the uh, non-formal and informal education aspects are very important. Uh, uh, the lifelong perspective, the life-wide perspective, the life D perspective are crucial in the, in the discussion to open the scenario of this, uh, of, this, uh, uh, of this recommendation. The next speaker is Professor Carla Sabatini. Um, she's a UNESCO Chair on Global uh, Education, edu no, sorry, in Education for Sustainable Development and Global Citizenship Education from the Universidad de Santandres uh, in, in Argentina. So thank you, Carla, for joining us. Uh, she will address uh, the topic of monitoring and policy learning uh, and uh, the role that academia can play in it. Please, Carla. Thank you very much, Dr. Tarosi. Thank you, Sofia, Katerina, and everyone, uh, especially Lydia, for the invitation to engage in this meaningful conversation with all of you. And uh, this is my second time uh, in this kind of dialogue with Angel. So 
it's a pleasure to meet some of you like Dr. Tarossi again. Um, well, I will start by briefly recapping on a few um, key ideas that the recommendation brings forth, particularly regarding policy and monitoring of learning, uh, to then pass on to think about what the role of academia can be in contributing to um, make uh, this opera, opera, operationalization of the recommendation come to life, as uh, we know that is so important and necessary right now. So let me begin by addressing this new understanding of peace that is brought forth by the recommendation uh, as a much more active and participatory process. And this entails a global understanding of other underpinning very complex ideas, such as interdependence, interculturality, understanding culture in a nuanced sense, like um, Lydia mentioned before, and transdisciplinarity. And these complex ideas are often very challenging and not only to uh, understand and communicate, but also to educate about, which is what we are gathered here today for. Um, secondly, I would like to bring your attention to the fact that uh, educational systems are now more than ever called upon to be fit for purpose, as Lydia mentioned in her, in her presentation. And this is a clarion call to revise curricula, but also uh, other very important aspects of uh, especially formal education, which is my part of, the, of, of this conversation, like teaching approaches, infrastructure, assessment, and many other aspects that need transformational policies as established in the recommendation action areas. And we know that our world is very unequal, so structural inequality is particularly uh, important and something we need to be sensitive about in the process of uh, putting the recommendation into practice. And then finally, um, although the recommendation establishes specific responsibilities for higher education and research institution in its paragraphs 52 to 57, particularly pertaining more and, and democratic and more open access to knowledge and dissemination and knowledge production as well, greater scope of partnerships and obviously ethical principles being at the heart of guiding uh, research processes. But it's important also when it comes to thinking about the role of academia uh, to think about the fact that in fact, higher education and research institutions can have a great impact on all other action areas as I would like to develop briefly later on. So with these ideas in mind as a starting point, I would like to acknowledge three specific challenge that we need to think about before we delve into the opportunities uh, for academia to make a contribution in enforcing the guidelines of the recommendation. So there are many challenges, but again, for time constraints, I would like to readdress the, the issue of complexity. Usually academic institutions um, focus a lot on knowledge dissemination and work, work like silos with a very strong focus on specific knowledge and uh, literacies that tend to renew in challenge and in complexity, like for example, artificial intelligence, which is a great concern now. However, mm, this often ends up in presenting learners with a fragmented idea of what the world is like. And this leads to fragmented worldviews. And this, again, can be a threat to uh, peace and uh, intercultural understanding in the senses that were developed in earlier presentations, particularly by Katrina as well. Um, but all this to be changed needs uh, a lot of capacity development. And capacity development of educators are no levels in order to co-design meaningful teaching approaches that favor learner-centeredness and that foster collaboration skills in the sense of the 14 guiding principles outlined by the recommendation. And research shows that in order to effectively address the challenges of our times, education must improve its efforts in all dimensions of learning, of learning, not only cognitive, which is often the main focus of academic institutions like uh, higher education institutions, 
so we need to pay greater attention to social emo emotional and also behavioral dimensions of learnings but but all this takes educators entails educators who are strongly equipped however capacity development can only be achieved by means of sustained policies and lack of continuity is then uh, another one of the challenges that we need to look at. Uh, often policies that um, enforce initiatives of capacity development tend to change uh, after a few uh, years of go a certain government uh, period of office. And this again is a stumbling block to transformational processes such as the, one, the ones outlined in the recommendation. So another key element to continuity is not only to keep a policy going beyond government flags, but also uh, to invest efforts and resources in monitoring progress and measuring progress. So in this sense, as Lydia pointed out, the recommendation can work for countries as a benchmarking tools to as a benchmarking tool, sorry, to measure progress in the desired directions. Uh, of learning that we have established so far. So having briefly outlined these challenges, uh, I would like to also think about a few opportunities that we have ahead, particularly uh, from the point of view of academia, but beyond academia. Academia can indeed support policymaking by raising awareness of the cross-cutting importance of the, the recommendation, by teaching about it in all fields, by fostering more interdisciplinary and collaborative approaches to knowledge production and dissemination, uh, and also, and most importantly, by rethinking the purpose of all its research and new literacies uh, and reorienting the purpose of what we want to create uh, professionals in societies for. And if it's not to bring together uh, societies so that we build a better future for all, then what is the purpose of educating professionals at all, right? Um, then academia can also work closer to um, other um, government agencies that work at level, lower levels of governance, which are closer to communities. So this can somehow make up for the lack of continuity in policy by being closer to uh, the people who are actually putting education into practice on a daily basis. And then uh, we can also enhance efforts to produce research about bottom-up um, different initiatives that are often scattered and unconnected, um, and they need systematization. And these small-scale initiatives can often be inspiring to others like um, by way of, co uh, of a complement to top-down measures that can take longer to have an impact. So thus, um, academia can have a concrete role in, help in helping leverage these initiatives. And finally, academia can work closely with UNESCO and other international agencies in order to join efforts to ensure that instruments like the recommendation become beacons for decision-making through curricula, capacity development, and other sustained efforts, and for educational purposes in general, uh, as I've tried to, said, to say before. And finally, I would like to close these brief reflections by paraphrasing Rachel Carson, a pioneer environmentalist whose work still inspires education for sustainable development and global citizen, citizenship the world all over. And towards the end of her life in a commencement address delivered as far back as 1962, uh, she envisioned the complexities of the times ahead and she warned us. And I think that her warning, uh, slightly altered for today's purposes, is very uh, rings true uh, today. She said something like, ours is a grave and soaring responsibility, but it is also a shining opportunity. We live in a world where human ch humankind is challenged as it has never been challenged before to prove its maturity and its mastery, not of nature, but of itself. Therein lies our hope and our destiny. Let us then join efforts to ensure this recommendation is known and put into practice far and wide as an instrument towards this purpose. Thank you very much once again for this invitation and for your attention.
Thank you. Thank you, Carla. Thank you for highlighting the role of uh, higher education institution for the academia community and uh, the role of research. This uh, uh, allow me to introduce the third speaker, Professor Karen Pashby from Manchester University. Um, and her um, speech is about the multifaceted and multi-sectorial responses to the revised recommendation, view from critical GCED uh, research. Karen? The, sh the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Massimiliano. Um, my brief comments will first focus on um, a thank you to Lydia and her team and kind of a reminder of this moment we're in together. Then I'm going to kind of explain a little bit about myself as a critical global citizenship education researcher and what I'm picking up from the recommendations. And then thirdly, I'll make some comments really nicely building off of our last speaker um, around how we might, as, as academics, support a multifaceted and multi-sectoral response to um, supporting the recommendations. So first, a heart heartfelt congratulations to Lydia and her team and all that have been involved We've been hearing about this for a long time and talking about it as such a massive undertaking. I mean, in a way, it's the enactment of global citizenship to have put something together like this that has been um, approved. So huge, huge congratulations. I think it demonstrates a will um, for transformative education globally and at a time when many of us are feeling quite a lot of despair having worked in this area for a long time and we believe in it but we're also scared about what's happening and I think that this recommendation is a touch point for us all to have hope and to work together. I particularly want to point out the ANGEL Network and um, how we're all here together. Many of you are members like I am and, and some of you are new, but we represent the academic community researching and practicing in the various areas of global education and learning. And the huge event that was hosted at UNESCO headquarters that Maximiliano uh, mentioned earlier um, in Paris last June really demonstrated its growing relevancy and importance as a knowledge sharing network that supports SDG 4.7. And it's this type of knowledge sharing network, I think, that will enable the transformative potential of the revised recommendations. So secondly, my comments will come naturally from my own positionality. I'm a former secondary school teacher. I taught in um, various places in Canada, but mostly Toronto and also in Brazil. Currently, a professor of global citizenship education. I've been studying global citizenship education through various means for the last 20 years or so. Um, at Manchester Metropolitan University right now. And I'm also president, current president of the Comparative and International Education Society of Canada. So that's where my comments are coming from. I first encountered the idea of educating global citizens actually when I was a secondary school teacher um, in Brazil. Um, and I was voluntold to be on a committee at the school to set a mission statement. Many of us remember doing that in the early 2000s. And the mission statement included that the school wanted to educate global citizens. Well, the discussions about what it could mean to educate global citizens resulted in some of the most ethically rich and difficult and complex discussions I had at that school. And it was a kind of multicultural school in many ways. And I've been researching and practicing in this field ever since as both a promoter and reflexive critic. So global citizenship education, as we know, is a concept that we in this community can somewhat take for granted. And it's a gift that keeps on giving to researchers because although, as Lydia mentioned, there is um, kind of a collective definition from the, um, that you know, is stated in the recommendations that we're all kind of familiar with. Um, it's also a constantly contested and, and evolving and challenging concept, which is really exciting and important if we're going to actually transform education in the way that we want to. So together with colleagues, my research has raised for scrutiny the multiple overlapping, contradicting at sometimes understanding agendas and approaches. And of course, these complexities are not easily solved and, and in fact are probably necessary, as I just mentioned, to the aspirational quality of what we're all trying to do. Um, and they can raise dynamic tensions. And I think that's why, um, as Lydia mentioned, this has been an ongoing process. And I really appreciate how the team at UNESCO always includes us, um, critical friends and people who are raising these questions, because that's how we're going to meet the aspirational qualities um, and the ethically reflexive 
crux of what it could mean to educate global citizens across the lifespan. And it's not to say that we can't mobilize complementary, if pluralistic, policies and practices. And I think the recommendations may become a really important nodal point for this work. And I think, as we just mentioned, a beacon. The critical global citizenship education research that I and so many of us on this call, I recognize a lot of names, um, have contributed to provides deeply theoretical groundings to our understanding of global citizenship. It facilitates collaborative and participatory insight um, from educators across sectors and formal and non-formal. And it has directly and critically engaged with policy in this area. And so as the Global Learning Digest that Angel produces um, attests to, there's a really growing reach for all aspects of research in this area. So it's a great moment for us to connect up with the implementation of the recommendations. And I actually, when I was reading through them, I can really see uh, the work that we've all been doing in them, which is a testament to, the, to all of the hard work people put in in the drafting. Um, and it's really exciting as someone who's been committed to this to see the opportunities. Um, I think it's gonna be really important for us in research communities to facilitate really direct research oriented discussions and to continue how we, in some ways, how we've already done this in big conferences like CIES and other international spaces, more local ones um, as well. We've, uh, Angel has, has been facilitating panels. I think we got to keep doing this. We really need to not take research for granted. And, and yes, it can be seen as an ivory tower. Really appreciate those comments you've just made in the, the last um, contribution. Carla, but I think we can't take that for granted. Higher education is also under an enormous amount of constraints. So we need to take this opportunity to build a vibrant research culture. There's underlying calls in the recommendation for critical reflexivity in the centering of concepts such as interdependency, humility, solidarity, recognizing wrongs, working against our colonial histories. These types of things um, aren't just for implementing into policy and practice, although many of us will contribute to that, but it's also to reorient ourselves as multi-sector members of this wider community. In fact, it is this multifaceted and contested concept. And given it is truly at the heart of this, these recommendations, global citizenship education, it's gonna be really important to build multifaceted and mechanisms for knowledge sharing and critical reflexivity. And to do this, we can build on existing multi-sector networks. So Angel is a great example, and it's tied up with Gene in Europe, which has a lot of policy pull in various nation states. But I know there's lots of examples internationally. Again, in Europe, we had Bridge 47 that brought together a lot of um, multi-sectors. And this is just what I know of, and I don't know everything. So I'm sure there's lots of more examples. I know Episeo, for example, has been hosting a lot of work um, and that's about not bringing in researchers. And this is something I'm just going to be straight up about. Sometimes I feel like as researchers, we get brought in to tell others what they should do. But I actually want us to facilitate the more dialogical spaces. Um, it's about building those spaces for deep conversations. So policymakers can then draw on research to deepen their own reflexive practice. And likewise, as researchers, we can do our work to respond to the difficulties and constraints that um, policymakers all the, and teachers, um, both informal, non-formal educators in general have. So I'll just finish um, with a couple of points. My experience has suggested we need more fora to engage directly with educators themselves. Um, the educators I work with are really motivated by feeling part of a critical mass internationally, but is very, and myself, I am definitely guilty of this. It's so difficult to bring them together for important reasons, like they're in the classrooms teaching or they're in the non-formal spaces doing their work. But I think that's a priority area because we want to mobilize the critical mass of educators who are already doing this work and want to even do it better. Um, and so at the, just to finish, I'm going to try and speak directly to our angel member networks, um, who I hope will be able to discuss in the breakout room some of these key contributions we could make, which could include continuing our theoretical and conceptual work to support the complex and responsive and reflexive approaches that we need if we want to be transformational. 
I think we can help facilitate the voices of practitioners and educators in terms of identifying and responding to key challenges and opportunities. I think in that way we could support generating data and sometimes it is about evidencing why this is important, but it's also about producing more knowledge and that can help us ask better questions and raise for identification what the deep concerns and constraints are. I think we can continue to serve as critical friends. At the ANGEL conference in June, we saw some really deeply critical um, approaches. I know the work of Audrey Bryan, example, for example, taking up you know, um, some of the unintended consequences perhaps of issues around socio-emotional behavioral learning, for example, we can continue those. Um, and finally, we can support in terms of implementation policymakers and those working on the ground in governments to mobilize discursive, dis, pardon me, to mobilize dis, discourses strategically, right? So we can help with that, like thinking through where are the strategic spaces, where can we find support? And I know there's some um, really good examples of that in the work Jean has done and others. So I'll finish there and thank you for the opportunity. Karen, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your for your words uh, and uh, for very nicely pointed out the role and the challenges for of the for for the research community. And this is is one of the key topics that we want to discuss within this uh, the, this community. So we now have a time for a breakout room uh, for this for the splitting up in uh, four uh, rooms. We have uh, mm, about 15 minutes for discussion. Once we have in, you are in the, in the breakout rooms, please remember to uh, design a rapporteur who will report uh, in the plenary very briefly some of the highlights coming out from the from the from the breakout rooms. Okay, I hope you had a. Uh, Decent discussion. So uh, now I will ask the rapporteur, the four, the four rapporteur, to briefly uh, report uh, the feedbacks. Some of the main highlights, I would say, just some of the highlight, the main topics addressed during the uh, the, uh, the the feedback. The feedback. So I, um, to be quite quick, we had a wide ranging conversation about a whole number of things. But what I think emerged is that people valued. The reference to peace they thought that's quite a very important development and i think that there was a sense in which people are also saying about the need to ensure that there's working together between policymakers, practitioners and researchers the sense about how we can all work together in terms of some of the issues and agendas there was a sense that people often felt that voices of practitioners can often be ignored and how do we ensure that's part of any process and I suppose the other thing that people were also raising was the whole point about the voices of students, particularly young students and young people, how they could be sure to be part of the process about moving forward. And the only last thing I want to say is that people were also asking questions about where does um, this initiative relate to other things going on within in UNESCO, particularly its work on sustainable development. And my final point is that people value some of the inclusion of certain words and languages that possibly hadn't been in some earlier declarations of themes this type, particularly the reference to decoloniality. Thank you very much. Um, our group um, chiefly discussed curriculum uh, in terms of implementation uh, of the recommendations into national and federal curricula. We talked about capacity development and inclusion into the curricula, both in terms of a bottom-up and top-down process which ties in to the idea of asking teachers for their preferences in terms of which areas to implement in their teaching. Um, but that kind of needs to be balanced with real life expectations and real life constraints that a lot of teachers have when it comes to designing lessons within a particular curriculum. And that curriculum may or may not um, foster the inclusion of the recommendation. This also ties in into more research which needs to be done in the informal education sector to see how people in the informal education sector um, do education and especially global citizenship education, sustainable, uh, sustainability education. 
I want to end on two positive notes because we also celebrated the very fact that this document was approved um, in the current political climate and from a personal perspective, but many will share that we also celebrated that it goes beyond the social sciences when it comes to subjects and subject areas and includes at least implies um, the inclusion of languages and the arts in what is important in terms of global citizenship education. Thanks. We actually cover quite a bit considering the short amount of time. Um, we had some um, recent graduates from master's research at George Washington University who shared with us some important research that's going on in um, the research center that focuses on refugee migration education and the importance um, of, a, it's a growing area and, and really important around learning that occurs in, outside of formal place environments or in displaced uh, contexts. And they have also provided us with some links to their research that I've put on the Padlet. We also talked about um, the ongoing representational issue that builds off of the point Doug made around people celebrating seeing notions of coloniality as something that we need to take up in this work. Um, but of course, it's ongoing issue around representation of quote unquote global South voices um, and how we, and, and that's a still very much a problem in, in academia and, and across sectors. Um, some really important ideas about intergenerational learning and that we're not going into the same, we can't assume the same teleological model of learning. Um, and particularly in Western contexts, um, we've kind of sometimes done the student-centered learning, which of course has important elements, but of course we also need to learn from elders and what kind of different models of intergenerational learning could we um, develop and learn from. Um, and then we talked a little bit about um, the need to foster concrete and effective dialogues between the conceptual, deeply conceptual work and the more practice-based work. And finally, um, we talked about um, some of the methodologies that are coming out around citizen science and action research as a space for interesting work. And I'll just put my last point, uh, my own personal point, which is I think this is a real opportunity for us to conceptualize stroke, reconceptualize pedagogy. Um, I think we have notions of pedagogy like active and, you know, the banking model and active citizens, you know, that that was all important, but right now it's getting a bit blurred or it can be overly uh, by it can become a binary that, and this is an opportunity through the recommendations to build together um, a robust or more nuanced uh, notion of pedagogy that could be relevant for policy practice and theory. Thanks. Thank you. Um, yes, from group four, um, a real, real sort of interest and concern in the group about how we can get close to practitioners picking up on um, one of Karen's points around, you know, making sure that we get academia close to the participants that are actually doing this in community and, and adult learning. Um, some questions around um, how do we create that common ground on the ground among diverse ideologies and perspectives and how can we uh, bring into this uh, voices from the global south where there is a big disparity in experience between different contexts um, and then we noted that uh, as was also said whilst there you know there was consensus among member states in the agreement of the new declaration and therefore the processes were there to make that negotiation successful so how do we engage constructive conversations on the ground and uh, an encouragement that as educators are, we, are, we are well placed to provide that space but an acknowledgement that there's a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of having that closeness with practitioners in and understanding diverse ideologies and being able to facilitate that working towards consensus and in terms of the methodologies um, that we might sort of think about using really what builds on that is the notion of making sure that we can center the voices of our participants as well. Doug mentioned that that often gets lost um, and, and we were thinking that actually that's really, really important and equal, equalizing the power dynamics between the academics and the participants, the, the people, you know, practitioners on the ground is, is really key to that. And co-constructing research and research questions um, can be a really good start to doing that and also being mindful of that through the research process to keep checking in that we're not adopting 
you know, a, a superior position in, in different ways would also be important. Thank you. Thank you for everyone for participating. Thank you for uh, contributing to the to the chat because there is an interesting discussion, parallel discussion in the chat, and there, there is another discussion, interesting discussion in the Padlet. Those comments, those questions are all important because I want to mention that uh, UNESCO, as Lydia initially mentioned, um, UNESCO is currently developing a follow-up strategy after the, the approval of the recommendation in November 2023. So the ideas uh, or share and raise today could be very important to, to support this implementation. And if, if, if I'm not wrong, Lydia, you are more than happy to receive the, some of the content and some of the suggestions raised from this uh, uh, this uh, the webinar and uh, later on. So before closing, I would like to uh, to give uh, uh, the floor at the very end to Doug Bourne, who is here just to, for, for a few closing remarks. Thank you, Massimiliano, and thank everyone for all the contribution. I am um, particular to Lydia and the team from UNESCO for the involvement and in helping to organize today's webinar, but also reminding us, I think, of the importance of this recommendation. And I and I think it's one of the really major things that we need to be considering internationally in our field in the coming months and years, because it, it's part came out of, some, of an international discussion and debate and brings together many of the themes that we've often been talking about, often in our separate little silos and boxes. And what I think this recommendation does is to see the value of all these areas being interconnected and in ways that we can all work together moving forward. I also think what also it provides is a very important opportunity to bring together academics with policymakers and practitioners, um, both at school level and all areas of higher and adult education. And to me, one of the things I would hope that will come out of this conversation today and how we move forward is how we can build on this and to ensure the dialogue that we've started becomes part of our ongoing work. Because to me, there's a clear opportunity here to have a major impact internationally with this declaration, which is a way of getting people to think about the connections to peace, human rights, sustainability, and global citizenship in a way that I think takes forward target 4.7 of the SDGs and also gives us a potential framework for going forward. So I'd like to congratulate UNESCO and all the work they've done so far, and we all look forward to working with you and taking this forward. Thank you very much.